Welcome everybody. My great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. We have uh, Gregory Boyd from the University of Oxford, uh, and actually uh, Balint Kocha also from the University of Oxford. So Gregory is a PhD student in a group of Simon Benjamin, and he works on, I guess, theory of near-term like quant quantum computers. And today he'll be uh, telling us about his recent work uh, on application of classical shadows to uh, learning on variational circuits. So this is a very exciting uh, subject. Great to have you, Gregory. The, the screen is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind invitation. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking today about work I did in collaboration with Balance, which is on training variational quantum circuits with uh, covariance root finding. And this leverages classical shadows to uh, to reduce the, the large measurement costs that our scheme might otherwise uh, incur. So uh, to sort of motivate and introduce the talk, uh, one of the potential main useful uses of uh, near-term quantum computers is in variational algorithms due to their limited depth requirements and uh, hybrid quantum classical nature. And in this talk, we're, I'm going to uh, rephrase variational quantum algorithm into a root finding problem rather than an energy minimization problem. And this has uh, several advantages in that it can show faster convergence along with uh, stronger theoretical guarantees for local minima and some resilience to noise. And here is a sketch. Well, it's not a sketch, it's real data, but it's of uh, a, a joint root of multiple functions that corresponds to an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian. Uh, so the prototypical um, uh, sorry, sorry. Can you yeah. uh, can you say again what is on the spot? I, I uh, didn't so so the, the the scheme. Well, it will, it will become clear. But the uh, the uh, the scheme involves finding joint roots of many functions, uh, and uh, this is one such like slice through a landscape of, of functions uh, showing one of the, one of these joint roots. Uh, thanks. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. Um, so the uh, the prototypical. Uh, variational quantum algorithm is the variational quantum eigensolver, where we create some state using a parameterized circuit like the one below. Uh, and we evaluate some cost function, which is usually an expectation value of a, of a, a Hamiltonian or observable. Uh, and then we minimize this cost function with gradient based methods, usually. Um, in our talk, we're going to be uh, considering, mostly considering these kinds of objects, this covariance functional, which takes uh, two Hermitian operators and a pure state uh, and returns a complex number. And in the case where A and B are the same, this is just gives the variance of the operator A on the state. And we can come up with a series of conditions that guarantee that the state psi is an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian uh, based on these covariance functionals. Uh, so we're gonna decompose this Hamiltonian into a series of uh, it's some linear combination of orthogonal basis elements, which you can just basically think of as Pauli, Pauli strings. Um, okay, so the first condition is a fairly standard one, that the variance of the Hamiltonian vanishes if psi is an eigenstate. Well, yeah. Uh, the second one is that you have simultaneous roots of all covariances with respect to the Hamiltonian and each individual term of the Hamiltonian. Uh, but it's actually also true that um, when psi is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, all covariance functions with the Hamiltonian uh, and any other operator will vanish. So here we write this as some, uh, so they all, all of these covariance functions with the Hamiltonian and some other operator vanish for all the operators in some pool. Uh, but of course the pool could be literally all of the possible operators. So in this way, this condition here is, uh, is a condition for being in an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And so we can rephrase finding eigenstates as finding these roots over these covariance functions, given some operator pool that we choose and some Hamiltonian. Um, sorry, can you give some inspiration? Why, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, why, why this is like a like sufficient condition for being like eigen, I guess it's necessary and sufficient, but uh, like uh, why something like this happen? Um, so, uh, one way to think of it is that in the state, when it's an eigenstate, uh, the Hamiltonian, the sort of value of the Hamiltonian, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is fixed. So how can it, uh, how can the covariance with it and any other observable be non-zero? Because uh, 
how they're not changing relative to each other to each other if the Hamiltonian is just a number when, right. when you're so in a line state. Kind of acts almost like identity then and in this uh, okay. Yes, yes, that's yeah. right. So the Hamiltonian okay. acts kind of like the identity up to a multiplication factor, the eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so how do you find roots? Well, the, the way that you're taught how to find roots in school and is, is still basically the best way is, is Newton's method, where you take uh, the tangent uh, to a curve and you follow it along to the axis. Um, and uh, this shows quadratic convergence towards uh, roots. Well, not all roots, but generally shows quadratic convergence to roots. Uh, so this leads us to uh, COVAR or covariance root finding. Um, where... Sorry to stop you. Like... Uh, but like uh, quadratic in uh, what uh, sort of um, yeah like so with the number of like iterations like you, you yeah. get uh, mm -hmm. uh, well I mean obviously that's not true if the root is uh you know is that is um it's not it's not if the root is uh has a minimum at zero at at zero or something but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. gotcha yeah. um so so this leads us to uh, to covariance root finding, where we uh, write this vector of covariance functions um, as a function of our variational parameters, theta, um, and we perform a Newton step, which we need to, uh, which in order to perform, we need to evaluate the, the values of these f's on our quantum computer, and we also need to evaluate uh, the elements of the Jacobian, and we iterate it to find an eigenstate. Um, in practice, we don't use uh, all of the operators. Uh, we choose some smaller uh, operator pool, and we don't even use all of them. We uh, stochastically randomly select uh, some number NC of them every iteration, uh, and then perform this regularized levenberg markart step. Uh, and uh, these levenberg markart methods have a, a series of advantages, including some, some uh, degrees of uh, guarantees for convergence, and this stochasticity of randomly selecting operators helps us to avoid local traps. Uh, and there's a and so how big how big would you like uh, NC to be? Well, the answer is uh, sort of as big as you can get, um, because the performance of the method increases with uh, with increasing number of uh, number of constraints. So here's this is infidelity on the on the y-axis, and on the x-axis x-axis is the increasing number of constraints. And uh, the blue, the blue curve is the uh, the one you should be looking at. Really, that's the case of no noise, uh, and the orange case is uh, is shot noise, which just plateaus off after uh, you know once it reaches some shot noise floor. Um, but you can see that the performance of the uh, performance of root finding increases polynomially with the number of constraints here. Um, but overall, okay, I just wonder because it's uh, no, it's very interesting, but sort of. Uh, okay, there are many things maybe to, to unplug here because uh, let's say okay, one thing is like the, those roots they they allow you if I understand well to okay you they maybe certify that you might be kind of close to like eigenstates right uh, but it doesn't have to be like a min let's say minimal uh, like you don't have to necessarily minimize the energy right so you. Like here, you are computing fidelity with some, let's say, target. How to put so, it? Uh, yeah. Uh, so in, there are like uh, many things going on here, and maybe yeah. Right. So this uh, this is uh, this is uh, the kind of problem that I will be describing some results later in the talk. But this is for a recompilation problem, uh, where um, the uh, where the state of the uh, of the ansatz is started close to uh, the sort of solution state uh, mm -hmm. in order to show uh, how how well the um, how close the method will converge to the solution um, mm -hmm. but so what, were you making a comment about uh, when you were making a comment about uh, finding you talk, talking about a minimum were you talking about a minimum yeah, in... so, but because I guess like for the variational circuits you would like to minimize um, optimize and <laughs> Actually, Greg, can we go back just one slide? I think it was here that, so the trick is um, that we have these covariances uh, that are given as a functional that depend on the quantum state. 
Now, what, what we make the extra step that we assume the quantum state is produced by some variational circuit, uh, where this circuit has a bunch of gates. Each, each gate has a certain rotation angle or parameter attached to it. And in the end, basically, we search in, in parameter space for a solution. And basically, we are looking for a set of parameters for which every possible covariance is exactly zero. That will, that will define a set of parameters, so a circuit uh, structure that prepares an eigenstate of some, some Hamiltonian. Sure. And, and yes, canonically, one would um, just define an energy functional, which is basically an energy surface as a function of, of the parameters. Mm -hmm. And you would, you would want to find the minimum of that. And so now we have loads of these um, covariance surfaces. We want to find a joint root. Uh, sure, sure. Thanks. Apologize, like there is some concert outside. Uh, <laughs> and like, sorry for this. Uh, please, please go, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, but on the uh, on the right side of this um, on the right side of this graph, um, uh, we're using a number of uh, a number of covariances approaching sort of ten thousand because new here is the number of parameters in in my uh, in my ansatz, which is about one hundred of the order of 100. So on the on the right side of this graph, uh, there are on the order of 10,000 or more uh, um, covariances. Are you set, I'm telling you that you're going to have to multiply the number of shots you're in your quantum, in your uh, variational scheme by that number in order to get useful uh, values. Uh, and the answer is that the answer is no, this is where we can uh, use classical shadows to uh, alleviate this, uh, this potentially prohibitive cost. Um, so classical shadows, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is a randomized measurement scheme for extracting, uh, efficiently extracting information from quantum states. And the sort of vague overview of the scheme is that we apply random unitaries from some uh, distribution, usually one that we can sort of classically, uh, uh, sim classically efficiently simulate, uh, and we measure all the qubits to obtain a bit string. Uh, we can then apply the inverse of this measurement channel classically uh, to contain a classical snapshot uh, of our quantum state and combine these to make a, a, a representation of our original state. Uh, and then we, can, uh, then we can calculate expectation values using these classical shadows uh, of our original state. Uh, and this has the advantage that um, we can calculate uh, a large number of expectation values using only a logarithmic number of, of shots. And the way that we use this in our scheme is that uh, we constrain ourselves when if we constrain ourselves to local Pauli operators, uh, this has one advantage of being particularly NISC friendly because the measurement channel is just mildly choosing to measure in the X, Y, or Z basis. Uh, but also, um, given a local, because if we're using a local Hamiltonian and we choose a local operator pool, uh, in this way, we basically always use like all three local Paulis. Um, all of the elements of the covariances and the Jacobian can be measured in uh, this uh, this number of shots, which is only logarithmic in NC here. Um, and this is actually uh, a, a shot cost that's comparable up to this log factor to regular gradient descent. Um, so uh, this allows us to uh, work with a very small overhead on our quantum computer, a small, very small quantum cost, and the classical cost of solving this large uh, linear system of equations uh, is only linear in NC. Uh, so this means we can easily scale to um, millions of uh, constraints without uh, the classical processing being uh, an overhead time. Uh, sorry, one, one point I got, uh, I, I sort of, uh, one point when I got a, a bit lost, it's like the, you mentioned that you have to solve linear equations. So is it like you iterate or you solve? Uh, this, this, Okay, this part maybe I, I missed. Like it's just yeah, for each iteration, uh, you need to uh, you need to invert the Jacobian and uh, and mm -hmm. and do that regularized step, and that cost is linear in the number of constraints. Uh, gotcha. Uh, right. So so it's so the something okay the something complex. So should I think of like the start of the Jacobian as effectively and okay. Uh, the, the, the size of the roughly size of the operator pool, uh, or yeah, so it's it's a 
Jacobian that is uh, it's sort of very very uh, very rectangular. One, one it's a it's a number of uh, parameters by number of uh, constraints. Uh, right. Matrix. Yeah. And and we expect the number of constraints to be a lot larger than the number of parameters. Uh, gotcha. So it yeah. still might be okay. So the upshot is like when like sampling complexity is not prohibited. Uh, still, like matrices can be uh, sort of because um, number of okay. I'm, Oh, actually, so there is one trick. Uh, so the complex classical complexity of inverting this matrix is linear. Reason for that is it's not a square matrix. It's highly, as Craig said, kind of elongated or rectangular. Mm -hmm. So one dimension is constant, is the number of parameters. The other dimension is the column dimension is this huge number. And in terms of that, you don't uh, like complexity doesn't scale with NC, let's say then. Uh, so, so solving the so inverting the Jacobian, so that that complexity scales with NC linearly. Uh, but let's say ten to the six, ten to the eight is still easily doable in like minutes. I see, but it doesn't. Okay. I see, but okay, because it scales just linearly, not in a quite exactly. okay. Yes, so yeah. it's just linear, yeah. So, and actually, it's not even. Uh, so, we did some tests with H HPC computers. Uh, 10 to the 8 is still easily doable, and it's actually memory bound uh, because the question is then how, how many of these constraints you can fit into the memory. Because then the computational cost is just linear, it's literally the CPU just goes through the, the memory array. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so finally, we can get to some results. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show some results for a 10 qubit uh, spin chain uh, with some random uh, on-site coefficients, which is uh, you know an interesting uh, test bed for things like uh, many-body localization. Um, and uh, there's a lot here, but uh, I'll get through it. Uh, so, uh, init so initially, um, we started off with a, a sequence of um, gradient descent. This is quantum natural gradient uh, to reach a low energy lying state. Uh, and the plan was to map map out these low low energy eigenstates using Cobar because it's uh, capable of finding uh, any eigenstate. So here we reach a low energy and then randomize the parameters slightly so that we find different states and run uh, several runs of Cobar to find uh, these to map out these low lying eigenstates. Uh, and we can see that actually uh, this green curve is the one that find the ground finds the ground state. Uh, converges much faster to the ground state than uh, the, the quantum natural gradient does. And in fact, it reaches an energy difference that's about two orders of magnitude lower than the, the, um, the blue dotted curve eventually converges to. Um, I'm sorry, what is, what, is, uh, what is the depth of the circuit, like the num like number of parameters that you have? And uh, like how, how, let's say, if you take a trial, let's say, a you said that you randomize your parameters to start from a bunch of initial states to get mm -hmm. the first like how how often you land in the state uh like how how often you get like this because mm. i guess you, you first did some uh optimization to to get like let's say after let's say 50 iterations right that you were doing something i forgot what it was maybe it was not natural gradient or yeah something like this and then you you kick in your method, if I understand well, right? Mm. Yeah. So you randomize the choice of parameters a bit. So like, how often did you get, like, because it's it's a randomized pr procedure, right? So so you, you got a bunch of uh, curves. You like uh, sometimes. Right. You, Are you like, asking me how how I selected those curves? Oh, or like I mean, like how how often you were getting the uh, you know because uh, like like. Like, is it like one in ten thousand times to get the green curve, or like convergence? I guess I guess every curve is from from a different randomly initialized. So uh, of these curves, right. which are on the thing, they were the first seven runs I ran. Uh, but there, there is a figure in the in the um in the paper showing uh sort of how close uh, sorry fraction of convergence to the ground state versus mm -hmm. like how close you start. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Good. Uh, I, I check it like okay, so there is uh, like the number of parameters, like what was the 
uh, about about a hundred. I don't remember exactly, but something like that. Um, no. no, actually, no, that was no, actually, that's not true. It was much longer for this one. Uh, but I, I, I don't remember exactly. Um, a few and quite, quite large systems, right? So fourteen qubits, perhaps, or this was ten qubits. Yeah. And yes, yes, and I think in the other figure it was fourteen. Mm -hmm. And so, literally, the classical computation takes a, a lot, very, very long time. I think, Greg, Greg you might re remember how. Yeah, some of the, yeah, we could have gone larger, but the runs we were doing already took about a day. So, mm -hmm. and yeah. I think they were large enough to not be trivially small. And an actually high-end GPUs, so it's it's very, very ex expensive to compute like thousands or tens of thousands of these covariances. Uh, Okay, and another interesting, so so one application uh, which was sort of showcasing here is finding excited states. Um, and another application uh, that we think there's use for is, uh, is recompilation, or more generally any problem that you can phrase as um, being solved by finding an eigenstate rather than finding a, just the ground state. Um, so the problem we're going to look at here is uh, finding um, a, a variational, a, a parameterized circuit U that uh, has the same action on some initial state as uh, some fixed unitary V or some process you want to learn. Um, and uh, one way to phrase this problem is, so if, if you've achieved this, then this circuit should, should output the all zero state. Uh, and one way you could optimize this is finding the ground state of this Hamiltonian, uh, which is the, the all zero state. But instead, you can find any common eigenstate of all of the uh, Pauli Z terms. And then you will have recompiled the output will be some computational basis state. Uh, and then you can just correct for the, for the X, X flips that you want. So this, this gives you a lot more freedom to find a solution. Uh, and uh, so here are some results. First, look, we're just going to look at the, the graph on the left. This is starting. So, well, okay, so in the numerical results, we look at uh, the form of V and U are actually the same. V is also a parameterized circuit, but it has fixed parameters. So the problem that we're trying to solve is discovering what the parameters in V are. Uh, so for the graph on the left, uh, we start, uh, both show the sort of infidelity of the, um, of the discovered state with the, uh, with the desired all zero state or uh, um, appropriate computational basis state. Um, and here we start close to the solution and this graph shows the difference in convergence between uh, VQE, which is regular gradient descent uh, with COVAR for two different numbers of constraints, uh, uh, showing a significant increase in convergence speed. Uh, and on the right, here we show uh, performance when completely randomly initialized in parameter space. And this black curve, the random covar, is what happens if you just run covar starting from a completely random point in parameter space. And this is why on that other, on that other graph, we first used uh, uh, natural gradient descent to initialize. Because if you don't initialize and you're not really close to any state, it doesn't really do anything. But if you um, first uh, initialize with a short period of gradient descent, uh, until you've reached uh, an overlap of 20 or 30% uh, with some state, then convergence is very rapid. Um, so, and on this... Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, Gregory, so you put uh, on the y-axis, you have fidelity, or, uh, sorry. Uh, infidelity, uh, yeah. Infidelity with some state, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, some, okay, so like, like this uh, right figure, so I understand that if you start like, with some random point, like you basically will likely converge to actually like orthogonal, uh, kind of orthogonal state, right? So, well, so, so, so this right you know, curve kind of far from or uh, let's say target state initially. Well, no, so this right, this uh, this right curve, so this one minus at max, it's showing the infidelity to the closest. Um, computational basis state because mm -hmm. we only care about finding a computational basis state. Mm -hmm. So the fact that this up here doesn't mean it's finding some orthogonal state. It means it's not getting close to any state at all. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
high state. Yeah. I mean, okay, so it's a maximal mix. No, it's not maximal mix, but like a maximal coherent. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's very similar to in in classical root finding. Let's say you know you have just a sing, single variate function. You, if you start root finding close to the root, it will rapidly converge. Mm -hmm. If you start far away from any root, and possibly you have something like local minima and stuff like that, then root finding will just jump back and forth without converging to anything. And so the black line is, is a very similar um, phenomenon, I guess. We are just randomly jumping. Uh, gotcha. So, and here you also choose the let's say local pool, uh, pool of Pauli, if, uh, if I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. you uh, or just, you just, I guess you expect that this method is like a, like all those plots, they have respect that it refers to, let's say, some natural gradient descent or some more like standard method, but then when you care really about convergence in the uh, in the end, like it's it's, it's really useful at, at the very end. Uh, right? Yeah, exactly. Or or if you have some other good method of initializing, um, and and something perhaps to emphasize is that I mean this is what you if this is what you would expect if you ran like phase estimation on just a completely random state. You know, where you wouldn't expect to get anything interesting out of it. You need to start with something that's close to. Um, uh, close to a state you want to find. Yes, and I think Greg even had a figure. I don't know if you have that in this talk, um, but in phase estimation, you know exactly that finding the finding an eigenstate is proportional to the fidelity with respect to the to that state in the initial state. And Greg had a figure that showed a very very similar effect that, depending on the fidelity of the initial state, you get um, a linear, roughly linear. Um, relationship between finding the probability of finding that eigenstate with Kovar. So it's, it's really interesting, I think. Mm. Yeah, but, but all these things are just empirical at the moment. It would be really nice to have some uh, some justification for why, why they were the case. Um, but, uh, okay, so uh, to conclude. Uh, Sorry, uh, could you just get back to the previous slide because yep. I missed the point. There are two VQEs here in the, the right plot. So what oh, is right. the difference? So, so this, uh, this, this pink curve here uh, is, um, is, uh, is a variance VQE, which essentially is uh, minimizing the variance of the Hamiltonian. So this is here for comparison as another method that is uh, agnostic to what is capable of finding any, would be capable of finding any of these uh, computational basis states. Uh, but it shows uh, the, the convergence performance of this is uh, seems quite limited. Okay, um, so uh, to conclude, we've demonstrated uh, a variation of root finding algorithm that shows that uh, some often shows faster convergence and can outperform other methods, uh, sometimes by orders of magnitude. Um, specific applications uh, include finding excited states and uh, recompilation and indeed any other problems people may be able to think of that uh, uh, are, are solved by finding uh, any eigenstate of some operator. Um, and further work includes uh, more advanced uh, investigations of the noise and methods for finding highly excited states, uh, which is an issue because you need to have some way to initialize close to a highly excited state. Um, and uh, alternative methods for using the classical shadows to, um, using uh, the classical shadows to more cleverly sample from the operator pool than randomly. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Gregory. Gregory, I didn't expect that you're gonna finish so fast, but okay. uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, right, thanks for a great, uh, great talk. Uh, there were some questions in the, throughout the talk, but we have uh, time for, for further questions or comments. Uh, please, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, Greg, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I have some questions uh, about those, uh, let's say, previous results, so not the C and D, but A and B. <laughs> uh, when you mm -hmm. So when you were, uh, or maybe this, uh, no, the previous ones. So when you were talking about like that, it took you, oh, I think you said that it took you a whole day to generate this, right? Uh, so I just wanted to clarify maybe like, uh, what part of it that 
took so because it's quite long for uh, like I mean okay this is ten qubits right I understand so like kind of what part of this is a part that you actually are just doing simulations of a whole quantum system and the procedure and uh, you know if you wanted to apply it on hardware then kind of how would uh, this uh, compare uh, roughly right so like kind of what part makes it so long <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe. Right. Yeah. Right, so the, the bottleneck in our sort of classical simulations uh, is actually um, uh, actually wouldn't be present in uh, if we were running it on a actual quantum computer because in our um, in our simulations we weren't actually using classical shadows we were just um, just calculating all of the um, uh, expect, uh, expectation values regularly because we're using a state vector so we didn't have shots in the first place um, so. Uh, so yes, I think uh, actually our simulations, the sort of classical element of our simulations was the bottleneck. Uh, and it, and this, this to be fair, this plot didn't take days. It was the, the first thing I showed with 14 qubits uh, with lots of data points that took, took the most time. Right, okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah so, the, so I understand then that this is the bottleneck, but then in if you're actually doing this on the hardware, then you need to take into account uh, a sampling, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, then do you have some ideas uh, how would like uh, how it works when you actually do need to make an estimation uh, instead of just calculating it um... right so i mean you have to take you have to be taking uh, you know even if you were just using gradient descent you'd have to take a large number of shots anyway to get yeah. the desired precision um so uh so it would basically you'd basically have to do the same number or you know a very small overhead uh to what you the number of shots you would already have to take uh, in order to obtain all of the covariances. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So okay. Th there was a figure of so I guess the previous figure showed what happens if you have short noise. Mm -hmm. So, so we have some arguments in the paper why it's actually very robust against short noise because we have this huge uh, overdetermined linear system of equations that we want to solve. And that's that's quite robust to um, basically random noise, um, and so the orange curve is the one that shows you get a pretty good performance up until the point you you reach the um, basically the limit set by shot noise. Uh, but obviously, if you increase the number of shots, then you can bring down that floor, that orange shot noise floor. Mm -hmm. um, and re regarding the classical computational bottleneck. So it's quite intuitive. If you have, let's say, a million uh, covariances, then you have to call your um, uh, procedure to cal calculate individually a million expected values, one of mm -hmm. the other. So it's quite inefficient. Uh, but amazingly, with a quantum computer, if you take, let's say, 10 to the 5 shots, then there is only a logarithmic cost to determining a large number of expected values, mm -hmm. with classical shadows. So basically, so, so nearly for free, uh, you, you get this huge number of expected values. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like uh, you need to still kind of like make those estimators uh, of the classical computer, but- it's... Yes, yes, actually that's um, calculating the expected values from, from the shadows. Yes. Um, is is actually not a bottleneck. So the inverting the linear system of equations is is, is mm -hmm, bottleneck, mm -hmm. but both uh, scale actually linearly with the number of constraints, class classically, mm -hmm. which, is, which is still pretty good. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh... I, I guess just that the, uh, the point, okay. Just maybe if I can allow to, to say some like high level comments of because actually we. Like with, okay, I guess it's mostly three, but also Yannick, they they actually play with running some variants of shadow estimation on real devices, and uh, like how was it? Yeah, so actually, you know, like some bottleneck, some practical bottleneck might have to be with actual actually data, kind of data flows, kind of from your. That's device right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. The, That's right. Uh, classical computer right like... and in fact not even necessarily yeah. just the data flow but um so for every measurement so for single shots you have to recalibrate your circuit oh, for 
no. for every single shot you you have to append a different x y or z rotation to your circuit at the end right. and so it's it's infeasible if you do that uh, like in a classical quantum feedback loop you, you literally have to do that inside the quantum computer with a, like an fpga telling your quantum computer to what to yes yeah yeah. Uh, yeah so i guess currently uh, processors are not yet uh, reconfigurable reconfigurable in this way, yes, but yes. they will Yes. I mean, Although, uh, some some experimental teams actually do that so for for turling you do the same thing um formally you implement the same circuits but you insert different gates which in the end can I, which would ideally cancel out to identity but still it helps to um uh, homogenize noise and so there are, right. yeah, that's how it's really that's right and so some experimental teams actually do that um uh, so without communicating to the classical processor, they automatically, for every shot, use a different rotation inside the circuit. Yeah. It's highly non-trivial. So here, perhaps it's like a bit, uh, just, there's a slight difference because you need to communicate to do post-processing, right? Uh, um, so it's, it's actually an in interesting um, engineering challenge. So I'd say it's sufficient here that you, let's say, on the side of the quantum computer in an FPGA, uh, you you buffer a bunch of outcomes or classical shadow, classical snapshot outcomes. Mm -hmm. So these are these are just numbers zero, one, two, whatever. Uh, you need to buffer them, and obviously, if you go up to extremely high numbers of expected values and shots, then you have to think about how can you offload it to the classical computer efficiently, um, and you will need very very high performance com communication for that um, yeah. I, th I think it's a question of engineering in the end but it's crucial uh, yeah so uh, just i have one one i mean some follow-up question to this discussion just so uh, so by uh, like uh, okay i think PhD, uh, sorry postdoc of amic ask a question like okay for what Okay, I didn't fully get your question. Like he doesn't have a mic, but like for how many qubits this is feasible? I didn't like. Is that uh, basically what you wanted to ask? But yeah, uh, and is I guess number of qubits. Mm -hmm. uh, so the okay, I guess it's like qubits. Like okay, how? Okay, it sounds yeah. Please <laughs> yeah. Like for like how like in in. I guess it would okay. That's if I can, okay. I guess it would depend on the, your, your system, like your Hamiltonian and so on, because it, it's formal and doesn't scale badly with number of qubits. The way I see. Yeah, I guess, right? I guess the, the bottleneck with the number of qubits is that um, this is a near-term stuff. It targets near-term quantum computers, assuming you don't correct errors in your quantum computer, and so in that sense, the bottleneck is um, the gate error rate, basically. So if you have a very low gate error rate, you can have a large enough number of qubits. Um, asymptotically, these things don't work out uh, because in terms of the number of gates, you get an exponential decay of the fidelity. And you can't really do anything about that. Uh, error mitigation can help to recover like high fidelity expected values, uh, but still at the cost of an exponentially increasing number of shots. Uh, so I'd say, What's what's the largest n possible? It entirely depends on the gate error rate. Uh, it's expected that uh, maybe, just roughly speaking, a ten to the minus four per gate error rate may be sufficient for fifty to one hundred uh, qubit systems. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's more like a question about like the whole like near kind of near town computers or like. Exactly. So it's not decoupled from, from that challenge. Uh, and, and so we don't introduce any further bottlenecks in terms of the qubit scaling. Um, and fidelity of quantum advantage schemes like by Google or by Hi-Fi, uh, they, they are like one, I guess it's like uh, one, uh, 1,000 is the fidelity or something. Like exactly. So uh, around 0.1%. That's the fidelity at 50 qubits around. Um, yeah. So for us, it would mean you need to take an extremely large um, number of shots or you have a huge overhead 
in the number of shots to make up for that small fidelity in the end, even if you use error mitigation. Uh, sure. So, uh, okay, one, uh, one, one question. Like I, okay, so I understand that you do sort of modif I mean, some version of like a Newton method, which is like you have the stochastic regularization based on like partial, like partial, like partially like reverting the, the Jacobian. So I wonder, let's say on higher level, like if you take statistical noise into account, like, because, okay, just, I didn't follow exactly the, like all the formulas, but I would expect that the accuracy of estimation of individual covariances that you need to really pull this off would also maybe scale with the like number, like size of the problem, like how many operators are in your pool. Is that correct intuition or? Well, so, the orange curve in this plot uh, here shows the where where you have where you have the uh, short noise floor, and apparently it's independent from the number of of constraints. As you can see, it's a constant as a number of constraints, mm -hmm. and the level of it depends on on the precision of estimating an individual covariance. Uh, so, okay, but just putting us like let's say. Just let's say putting as I say empirical maybe plot like but like on the side okay if I were to maybe try to give some guarantees for the I mean maybe yes, like, I, like, I remember in the paper we, we give some theoretical guarantees in in under some assumptions so so, so you can justify why why this is the case I, okay I remember we spoke in, in Bristol and okay sort of like you you don't do I mean as you explained you don't do exactly something. Right uh, in your simulations, but you sort of yes. uh, model it by a let's say stat let's say statistical noise, right? Like if, that's like, right. Yes. Yes. And, okay. Here is my my question. <laughs> okay. This is a, like when you model it, right? Because you um, okay. How to put it? Like when you have a few let's say few covariances you want to estimate, or like few yeah. Um, then. Um, Okay, it's kind of maybe it's kind of maybe fair that you sort of you would maybe assume like some independent noise, so so maybe you don't do that. Yeah. But kind of when you have this big big pool of data, I would expect some dependencies, sort of between. Sure, like, there should be some correlations present if you do so, it with real data. Like sort of this uh, this plot, if I understand, so so some analysis that you have is kind of under the assumption that you sort of uh, i mean look okay like the point is sorry like okay i allow myself to, to say so because like the you finish bigly after like half, half an hour so you to, you're not feeling that no no i'm laughing like uh, but uh, uh, like uh, how is it so like the whole point about as far as i understand of classical shadows is that you kind of simultaneously have access to estimators of those many quantities that's right, but, exactly. Yes. So that you one can expect that there will be some not kind of quite significant kind of correlations between those estimators. And uh, then, might uh, be, yes. Uh, like, so just, uh, you know, on, on maybe intuitive, okay, intuitively, maybe uh, because, like, you know, you're not repeating your experiments separately for every uh, quantity that you want to estimate. You kind of, yeah. So that, uh, okay. This is some concern, but okay. So that's actually, actually a good uh, question, and and um, th this was something I was also wondering about. I haven't really found anything on this in the shadow paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question would be: if you estimate these, this many um, expected values, there should be some correlation between them. Uh, well, in a sense, there. Okay, like. There are some, there are some, okay, like when they, there is something, like, because you can at least, uh, um, you know, like, because one way that people do, like, the, the basic thing about those shadows, sorry, because uh, it's like you, you estimate just Pauli's, right? Uh, That's right, yes. Uh, uh, like, local like, Pauli's, actually. Pardon? Local, uh, so yeah, local. Yeah, local Pauli's, so it's like the basic thing, but the next step, that some that okay in principle it varies in those papers is that you have also have uh, 
uh, you know, uh, Hamiltonian. So we have linear combinations of those boundaries, uh, non trivial ones. And then they analyze covariances, sort of between, uh, like, sort of, uh, you know, you have like an estimator for power P and for power Q, and they are, there are some covariances. Oh, but actually, so the co covariance, it's a quantum covariance. So what we actually do. Uh, well, the the is just even as a linear combination of just expected values. Uh, no, no, but I mean covariance between estimators. I'm, estimators. I mean, uh, like they sort of, I mean, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, okay, maybe it's just, because like this covariance appears in the, the word covariance is overloaded here, right? Because yeah. you have, uh, one thing is to have like estimators, one thing, another is. Yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, the term is a little bit overloaded because, because we. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's nice to have that. Uh, discussion. So there are some results about dependencies between uh, those. Uh, yeah. Okay. So any other questions or comments? We got like. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, hi. This is Gautam. Am I audible? Uh, yes. Yes. Please. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. So you use these covariances, which are quantum covariances. They naturally appear in this uh, standard deviation based uncertainty relations. Do you think that you can like uh, somehow relate it with like other uh, uncertainty relations or something like that? Because these uh, they naturally appear in this uh, standard deviation based uncertainty relation. So I was thinking maybe it is somehow related to it. So these aren't really. I'm not sure how they would be related to standard deviations. So these no, are no, no. Uh, uh, um, standard deviation based uncertainty relations. These covariances appear uh, on the right hand side of these uncertainty relations. Oh, maybe okay, can we go back to Greg to your slide on, on the definition of this? Yes, so this equation uh, one yeah, is how we define. These, uh, these equation one, these terms, they appear in the standard deviation based uncertainty relations. I see. What's the error of uh, of it? Can you maybe explain what what that means? So when we like um, for a standard deviation uh, based uncertainty relation for these two observables A B, so there is a covariance term. Uh, I mean, we can write write the right hand side in such a way so that a covariance uh, term like this, which is which we have in equation one, it will appear. So, uh, so I was thinking whether it is re related to the uncertainty relations somehow. Might be, I guess. Although I'm, I'm not aware of these um, standard deviation based uncertainties. I mean, it's the it's the most. I mean, the the most used uncertainty relations, the standard deviation, like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a commutator term on the right hand side in the usual uncertainty relation, but if you write it uh, uh, in a different way, so one can actually separate out this covariance. So uh, like uh, when you have more than two observables, uh, then uh, you have like um, a di many different form of covariances. So um, I see, I see. So we only have two, and you're right that uh, actually equation one specifies uh, a kind of covariance, which is a complex number. Canonically, it would be described by two kinds of um, numbers, a real number and a completely imaginary number. So the mm -hmm. real number would be the anti-commutator. So where you have the product A and B, instead of that, yes. you have the anti-commutator between A and B. And in the purely, yes. in, in, in the purely imaginary uncertainty, you would have the commutator between uh, A and B. And so the sum of these two is actually exactly what we have in equation one. So it's just, um, it's a more compact way of writing those two. Yes, yes, exactly. So yeah, I was thinking maybe like, um, so maybe one can, I mean, I don't know, I, I have no idea about how these things work because I've not, never worked in this, but I was thinking whether it is somehow related to the uncertainty relations, so. Oh, it is, it is certainly related, exactly. So um, okay. if you have an operator pool, that consists yes. of um, operators, you compute these co covariances between any possible pair, 
that gives mm -hmm. you a matrix, a covariance matrix. And so okay. this will have all the fundamental properties of covariance matrices, uh, including its uh, um, positive semi-definite. And, mm -hmm. and so you, you can relate it to classical covariance matrices. OK, OK, thank you. Hmm. So actually, some, some like, discussion just now, some, like, something came to my mind. So like, regarding this operator pool, does it, of course, because it's like covariance, it kind of expresses non-commutativity of observables. Exactly. Right? So in that sense, of course, it's related to, to Heisenberg, Roberts, Don uncertainty like relation and uh, so, uh, but like from the point of view of this optimization like let's say i'm choosing the operator pool that makes i guess it would make sense to choose operators that like don't commute uh like the that's right exactly otherwise otherwise you can't even find yes not the the compatible ones right that yes but, because like commuting ones, they don't give you anything because covariance is zero anyway. Exactly. So what helps is that we, we choose a very large set of operators. So basically all three local operators and we randomly select from them. So definitely there will be a large right. number of them that will not commute with your target operators. Right. Um, but in the paper, we actually relate this idea to subspace expansion, which is a technique in, in near term. You, you might know that yeah. uh, where you expand in, in a small subspace around an approximate eigenstate by making use of an operator pool very similar to our, our construction. And the subspace expansion idea comes from actually quantum chemistry because there you can really well motivate, intuitively motivate your choice of an operator pool just by selecting the lowest excitation operators. Um, so in that sense, we know in quantum chemistry and related fields, you have a really good idea how to select really good operator pools that give you, give you lots of information about orthogonal directions where, where you can go. Uh, but in general, it's a challenge. Uh, it's a heuristic uh, how you select a good operator pool for subspace expansion, for example. Uh, the nice thing is that we are we just we can just estimate an extremely large number of these covariances. So we don't really care if some of the covariances don't give much information. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, we are extremely robust to the, the the particular selection of of this operator pool. Right. Uh, cool. Okay. Maybe. Okay. One more question for you. Uh, like, like, do you have some intuition how one would maybe modify the scheme to sort of ensure that you kind of converge to, like, to the minimum, let's say, energy? Like, is it? Uh, I mean, okay. This is like okay. Just... <laughs> That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> um, that you are not, not even supposed to solve because we know that finding the ground state, even of a local Hamiltonian, is QMA hard. And so it should be difficult even with a quantum computer. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so, and, it's, and it also implies that you are not supposed to efficiently just come up with a good initial state for, for just an arbitrary problem. Right, right. But of course, you know, in practice, you, you, you might, so in, in, in quantum chemistry, you can use, for example, um, hartree fock states and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so there are some problems in practice where, where you may give good approximations. Gotcha. Uh, but we oh. don't expect, we certainly don't expect it to be general. Uh, right, right. But, but there may be some ways you can like, combine elements of this approach with uh, elements of sort of um, energy minimization based methods to yes, yes. stop you from, you know, kick you out of uh, excited states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a natural gradient has been shown to be uh, quite robust against getting trapped in local traps. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in that sense, it's a better choice than gradient descent, but there is no general guarantee you can do this. Right, okay, one more. Okay, this I should have asked if you are having this. Like, what about barren plateaus? Would you have, uh, would this suffer from, I mean, okay, it's a different, yeah, would it, I mean, it's, okay, on high level, those are like similar quantities. Would you uh, have barren plateau or not uh, in general here? 
Like, so, right. this, yeah. So I think this, what's happening in this black curve is basically the equivalent of a, a well, the, the analogous equivalent of a barren plateau for, for our mm -hmm. method, right? Uh, and, and even in this case where a regular VQE doesn't have a barren plateau, this still um, has, has an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, yes, yeah. yes. Also another important point is um, with classical shadows, with, with this cheap version of classical shadow where you only do local polys, you can only estimate local expected values cheaply. Yeah. So that means you're limited to Hamiltonians that, that are local. And it has been shown that local Hamiltonians don't suffer from barren plateaus. So we know that there is a, an efficient gradient initialization even from random parameters. But we, we are more, more, more vulnerable to starting from random initial states. Okay, but I, I'm I'm sort of confused. Okay, I, I'm not. Okay, uh, what about just even class? Okay, this is like. I thought that even like in QAOA you can have barren plateaus, perhaps. Um, well, I, I wasn't fully precise, so it depends on the circuit depth. Yeah. Uh, if you have a shallow uh, polylogarithmic circuit, then local Hamiltonians don't don't pose a problem mm -hmm. for, for for barren plateaus. Obviously, if you have rapidly increasing circuit depth, then you will mm -hmm. always run into barren plateaus. Right, right. Uh, gotcha. No, because I was sort of, yeah. Because like, like here's, okay. He, okay, uh, maybe we can sort of, uh, no, no, okay. Just one, one last thing, sorry. <laughs> uh, like uh, just maybe on, on high level, like this barren, Plateau is like that. There are some gradients or some like variances are kind of uh, like kind of okay. You let's say some gradients is vanished, but like here where you have multiple quantities or even exponentially many, formally exponentially many quantities, uh, you may you know it's like one thing to say that with huge probability over the choice of your circuit, let's say uh, over the parameters in your uh, variational circuit. Uh, some cost function is close to zero, or like some specific, like polynomial with many gradients or derivatives are close to zero. This is one thing. And another thing is sort of looking on like ex potentially exponential in many quantities, because you uh, like, it, yes. it makes it sound like that they are simultaneously uh, sort of close. Like, okay, maybe. Uh, I, I don't think maybe that... more robust. I, I, uh, no, I mean, yes. So your approach may be more about. So the, the worst thing can happen is that you are in a barren plateau, which means if you increase the system size, your gradient will vanish exponentially. And yeah. so that's a, that's a problem to us just like in VQE, because even though we don't have gradients, uh, we, we have the Jacobian in which we have these derivatives. So it means that every entry in the Jacob, Jacobian becomes very, very small as you increase the system. I see. So it will suffer from the same. Mm. Yes. Right, OK. But OK, this is like, uh, OK, maybe we can follow, OK. <laughs> we can follow it maybe later. Because like, what my point is, my point was that in principle, this, uh, this Jacobian can be very large, because you kind of just randomly pull those uh, Okay. Yes, but there okay. is there maybe some mathematical subtleties because it, it might be you now in random matrix theory. What sort of, for instance, happens is like when you look on the like uh, absolute. Okay. No, let's let's go that I, I, I took over the seminar anyways with my question. So Please. let's have a chat sometime sometime later. It, it sounds interesting, and actually, it would make sense to apply random matrix theory to this because basically we have uh, if you have very, very, very small gradients. In the end, you just have shock noise in your Jacobian. You can't really ex extract any information from that. But what we have in practice is some non-zero gradients hiding under shock noise. And so in a very, very large matrix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, thanks I, very much again for the invite and thanks Greg for, for the nice talk. Uh, yeah. Matt yeah, many thanks, Greg and uh, Valens. Uh, like last chance to ask something to our uh, uh, guests today. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, can you please repeat? 
last chance to ask something to uh, oh yes <laughs> hello uh, hello uh, yes. thanks for your nice talk uh, i think i have a general question what is uh, can you define quantum in the quantum resources that is used for the algorithm what is, can you define quantum in the quantum resources that you exploited for the classical shadows yes we we in the paper we give um explicitly how the quantum resources scale okay as a function of the number of constraints in, in particular it's logarithmic in the number of constraints mm -hmm. and linear in the number of circuit parameters okay okay but even the results we give in the paper are thought to be sort of quite pessimistic bounds okay okay uh, okay, okay. okay thank you many thanks so if there are no further questions that Thank our uh, speaker again. Uh, thanks, Gregory. Uh, thank, thanks, Balin. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye.